Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for the little confusion about the time today, but uh, a little bit of a miscalculation uh, time difference between Israel and, uh, and Montreal. Uh, Two o'clock here, it's nine o'clock in Israel, and our guest today is Dr. David Zlotnick, who's the uh, medical director of the Terum Clinics. These are uh, urgent care clinics in Israel, and they're somewhere at, uh, in between uh, general practice and the uh, emergency uh, room. Uh, he'll be joining us, uh, and uh, also we have uh, Jonathan Jerry, my colleague at the McGill Office for Science and Society, and organizing everything and making sure that we answer your questions uh, is Emily Shore. Okay, well, uh, we're going to get started with the uh, scene in Israel, which uh, up to a couple of weeks ago was uh, looking very good, right? Cases were down and uh, not quite that good today. So uh, why don't you bring us up to date on what's been happening? So I get, hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I would say that things are still pretty good. I mean, you know, if you look at the absolute numbers in the country right now, uh, we've had about 17,000 positive patients overall. Uh, there are have been about 290 deaths, unfortunately, which is you know still a, quite a low mortality rate. Uh, and we only have about 2,000 active patients currently in the country. So the numbers are looking pretty good. But you're right that you know about three weeks ago, a month ago, the numbers of new cases every day were really really low. And you're talking about probably under 20 cases a day, sometimes even five to eight. Uh, patients, a uh, new uh, COVID positive patient today. So the numbers were looking extremely, extremely great. And that led to the, you know, the sort of the reopening uh, of the country that happened in phases. And, you know, I, I think that was appropriate, although I think the phases happened a bit faster <laughs> than maybe I would have expected. Um, and we're seeing a little bit of a bump and a little rise in the numbers uh, in the last uh, week about uh, since that. I mean, I think part of that is to be expected. Um, you know, I think I don't think you know anyone should expect that when you're going to reopen after or in this environment, you're going to have maintain the same number of of low cases. There, of course, will be a a spike. Uh, the question is if you can control that spike. Um, what's happening here right now is that the spike is coming mainly from the schools. Uh, we've had uh, I just checked the stats before we came on, and we've had about uh, about 301 students in the last uh, week or two that have become positive from school. Um, about 13,700 uh, of the students were sent into isolation, and about 72 uh, schools in the country have been closed. And there was some debate about closing the rest of the schools for the rest of the year or not, um, but so far the rest of them are staying open. And, you know, I think part of that is to be expected. Part of that was made moving a bit too fast. Um, but again, that's sort of the situation in the country now, where overall the numbers are still pretty good, and, you know, the number of serious cases are quite low. Um, but we are having this rise since the reopening. Uh, the schools, uh, how do they get such exact numbers of, of uh, students who are infected? Uh, so remember here in Israel, they're very, very uh, uh, good or uh, tracking. And uh, anyone uh, who is positive, again, has to go into forced isolation. They are followed, they are tracked, they are quarantined. Anyone who's been with them in contact for the last 14 days has to be uh, go into quarantine as well. And of course, everything is uh, followed very closely by the epidemiologists, by the Ministry of Health. Again, it's it's, it's law. The police follow up. Uh, but are the kids the being tested in school? Uh, so, okay, so the kids are being tested, and they've ramped up since. Yes, since uh, they've had a few cases of a teacher being positive and kids going into quarantine, they basically opened up testing uh, in in the country, even and especially in schools. Whereas initially, you had to have to be, to be tested for COVID. You had to have either this. You had to have symptoms and uh, basically come back from a flight, or you were supposed to be in isolation for some reason, like coming back from a flight or being in contact with a known positive. But now, even asymptomatic patients, or, or not patients, asymptomatic people, like all the kids in the school, can go get tested. So there's been a lot more testing. Yeah, uh, statistics uh, are. You know, it's been said that statistics can lie, of course, and numbers are, are very confusing. And uh, one of the most interesting things is what's happening in Belgium. Belgium right now has the, by far the most deaths per capita. And the question is, why? What is, what's happening there? And uh, the chief epidemiologist uh, says that actually their numbers are, are correct and most of the other countries are wrong. 
because uh, they're very, very adept at determining who died from uh, from uh, COVID. And they can determine even without a positive test, just from the symptoms and from the, you know, the, the clinical uh, situation. Whereas in other countries, it's only confirmed COVID cases that are being counted. And this makes a very big difference. I mean, Trump was on there pontificating uh, last week with a chart showing Belgium terrible, US in the seventh, seventh place, you know, being very good. Uh, totally misleading because of the way that the counting is, is being done. And I think one of the most interesting counts is when you compare number of people dying per week now compared to the same week last year. And there the numbers are, are very interesting because no matter which country you look at, the numbers who have died in the same week are much greater than uh, last year. So the, the COVID is happening. Something else that just uh, uh, came out this week, of course, is this new study on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there was a major study on the Lancet that Jonathan will comment on in a second. But we also had a, a study uh, from McGill in collaboration with the University of Manitoba and two other universities where they looked at people who had exposure to, to COVID, either a family member or in, in a medical situation. And placebo controlled trials, some of them got hydroxychloroquine to see whether or not it would prevent the disease. Some got a placebo. And the answer is, is very clear. There was no st statistical difference. So it does not prevent. Uh, and again, this is exactly why Trump was taking it to try to, to prevent it. We now have the evidence pretty clear cut that that doesn't work. Of course, uh, we don't yet know whether or not if someone already has the disease, when you give it to them, does it have any effect? So Jonathan, that's, that's exactly what was explored in that Lancet study, which has become quite controversial. Yeah, but you know, Trump was saying it's going to be a game changer. You're going to see it's going to be terrific. Uh, but that's the thing. There was there was a big study out of the Lancet. Now this was not a trial. This was an observational compilation of, of observations from hospitals worldwide of patients who had had COVID nineteen and who were treated with uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and, and a particular antibiotic. And the conclusion of that particular study, and again, this is the Lancet, this is a major medical journal, the conclusion was uh, that it can actually cause harm. There was a clear signal for harm. And because of that, uh, the World Health Organization decided to suspend all trials, ongoing trials, using chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19. Now, there's a problem there, uh, which is that uh, this particular study and other studies coming from the same group are now under a very close scrutiny uh, because there are things about them that just don't add up. Uh, the data on which these studies are built were put together by a, a small company called Surgisphere. Uh, and Surgisphere has between three and 11 employees. It's not clear. It was founded in 2008 as a, an academic textbook publisher. Uh, one of its employees is a science fiction writer. Another one is an adult film actress. Um, and they supposedly managed to gain access to data from over 1,200 hospitals all over the world. So they managed to sign all of these data release agreements with all these different hospitals, uh, depersonalize or anonymize the data coming from all of these hospitals and managed to do their analysis. And so that just does not add up. And so, um, so some scientists were, were very skeptical of that. They brought this up, and now the Lancet has issued a, an expression of concern, and they have, uh, in uh, they have started a, um, an independent review of what happened there. But it's not just that particular study. There was another study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, another major academic medical journal uh, that had to do with, with uh, certain medications like ACE inhibitors, uh, certain heart, heart medications uh, that claimed that these medications were protective against COVID-19. But again, the data came from this same mysterious database that Surgisphere allegedly has. So we don't quite know what's going on, but the, the, the main issue here, of course, um, is the fact that we, we stopped trials of, of these drugs. Now, there were never great evidence that these drugs would work for COVID-19, but still we should do things you know, diligently. And then the other, the other aspect is trust in science, right? Because you know, we start to say, oh, chloroquine is gonna be our savior. And then some people are saying, no, we're not, we're not quite sure. And then there's a big study in the Lancet saying, it's, it causes harm, stop it, stop it. And now we're saying, no, actually this might've been fraud. 
And so this back and forth, which, which I mean, this always happens in science. There are cases of fraud, there are cases of misconduct, there are cases of cutting corners, a lack of rigor, all of that. This is not new, but now it's being accelerated because of COVID-19 and everybody's tuned in to see what's going on. And so I am worried about what this can do for trust in science and trust in public health authorities in the long run. Because of course there's going to be people who claim fake news, fake news uh, about this, of course. Uh, this, this study. <clears throat> Uh, okay, let's move on to, to masks. And uh, I finally have the uh, appropriate uh, mask. Can you move closer to the camera? I don't think we can see them. Oh, I see. Oh, that's cute. And your name is there as well. <laughs> yeah. What else, uh, would, what else would they be? In terms of design, I, I, I just wish that I could breathe through it. <laughs> But uh, it's more of a collector's item than anything else. But uh, uh, here in, uh, in in Montreal, particularly where uh, where I live in in, in Cote Saint Luc, uh, law uh, is now in effect that if you are indoors, in any kind of store, any kind of public uh, institution, you must wear a mask. And uh, I think people are going to abide by this. And uh, I think there there is enough scientific evidence to suggest that this is the case, that that this is appropriate because infections are transmitted inside far, far more than, uh, than outside. So I, I think this is probably a, a good move. Uh, wearing a mask outside, that's a different story. I, I think walking on the street, uh, I don't think that, that merits it. But what about these demonstrations that we saw uh, last week with thousands of people sardined into small areas, some wearing masks, some not? What do you think? What are we going to see as a consequence of that? I think certainly, um, you know, during the during those demonstrations and being in such close quarters, even though it's outside, but being close quarters to so many people for for an extended period of time, that does certainly increase the risk. Um, here in Israel, actually, masks have been uh, are, are are a must, and by law, you must wear a mask even outside in any kind of gathering, uh, and even anyone really, we're just walking outside. You're supposed to be wearing a mask by law, not only not only indoors. But I do agree that you know the the risk of you know, going for a walk by yourself or with a family member outside with no one really around you, there's no real benefit to wearing a mask. Certainly indoors, uh, it seems to be the highest risk is sort of being indoors uh, for an extended period of time without good ventilation. That seems to be the highest risk for, for COVID transmission. But uh, in any gathering outside, so for example here, you know, uh, in prayer quorums or a lot of prayer services were happening outside, now they move back, they've actually moved back inside with certain criteria. But even even outside, you're staying, standing in one place, even if you're two meters away, but you know next to a, it's sort of in a gathering as they call them. So then masks uh, are, are, are 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 more beneficial. And I think certainly in the demonstrations, when you're having even more people close in close quarters, and are people right? abiding by it on the streets? Are they wearing the masks on the streets? Um, no, in general, I think some people are, but a lot of people are not. Um, I think more people are abiding by it indoors, like you know which is sort of like in sense, maybe not legally, but scientifically more appropriate. <laughs> like if you're going shopping or whatever, I think I see more people, very few people not wearing a mask. But when you're, you know, sort of outside walking by yourself, I, it's not much of a logic to, to wear that. So many people are not. Many people are. But, or you Our have people, people, of course, are worried now about air conditioning and ventilation systems. And there's a bit of comfort. I mean, I'm looking for comfort wherever it can be found. In this study... Uh, which uh, is an examination of what happened on the Diamond Princess. Now, the Diamond Princess was a landmark uh, situation. This was the ship that was quarantined for two weeks. Eventually, there were some 670 cases on here. But it was extensively investigated. And it turned out that after people were put into quarantine and had to stay in their cabins, there was no one who got infected through the ventilation system. Only people who were in the same room with someone who had already been infected got, in, got infected. So that's a, a bit of comfort that it isn't being transferred easily through uh, ventilation systems. On the other hand, you know, we also had that story out of China with the restaurant where they mapped the table and the, the chairs and exactly which way the air was flowing from the AC system. And it turned out that uh, people who were in the path of that airflow uh, did get uh, infected from one infected uh, person. Uh, 
Uh, but that that's different than a ventilation system that has filters built uh, into it. But anyway, like, like you know, we all said, indoor environments with lots of people, with uh, uh, no real fresh air being pumped in, those are the real uh, risky situations. I don't know if you remember the movie uh, Bubble Boy with Jake Gyllenhaal, but maybe that's what we need, these giant plastic bubbles around us as we move uh, throughout the world. Right. Where... <laughs> One thing I saw is that someone had designed this thing that you wear, which is a huge ring around you. It's sort of like a giant hula hoop. I saw that too. <laughs> so keep everyone at two two meters uh, or, or, or so away. Um, Dr. Fauci, who's not been seen all that much uh, recently, <clears throat> but uh, he had a commentary today uh, about the prospect of, of, uh, of the vaccine, uh, saying that, you know, it's a bit ambitious to think that we're going to have something really effective within, you know, within a year. But he also made a very interesting point, and that is that even if we do get the vaccine, it does not guarantee lifetime immunity at all because it is much more likely to offer very short-term immunity like the flu vaccine, which offers you immunity from, you know, for that year. So, uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of eggs being put into that uh, vaccination basket. And uh, I think some of them may break quite easily. I guess uh, I think maybe people reflect back or, you know, on, on SARS, where, you know, you had this outbreak of SARS was obviously much smaller and, and less infectious. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it sort of disappeared on its own. And so that was, you know, we know SARS was a coronavirus as well, obviously, and where the influenza, you know, the flu is an influenza virus, a different virus. And the uh, influenza keeps sort of, you know, different strains every year and you get, you know, more temporary immunity. So maybe there was initially, or maybe there still is this thought of, you know, that in, in the coronaviruses, like in SARS, if you have the right vaccine, um, it will it will confer longer immunity. Well, it'll I be guess at the end. Like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you well, go. I said, I guess at the end. We, we keep calling it, <laughs> sorry, we're passing, we keep calling it like the novel coronavirus. You know, it's, we're still learning. There's so much to learn. We just don't know. We just don't know. We're still learning. I was going to say, I just find um, uh, it interesting because, you know, I, I do, I almost find that there's been this, this like trust in science a little bit more now just because everyone is like waiting for, of course, there's people that are not waiting for a vaccine and obviously they're the outlier, you know, but like we're waiting for a vaccine. All of a sudden we know how it is to live in this pandemic and everything, but as we've heard from Dr. Offit and, and Dr. Ward on previous webcasts, I mean, there's going to be some different iterations of this vaccine from different, you know, companies and to make that many. And, you know, it has to, there has to be um, like team, team building. And also at that point, and it's skipping steps, right? There's been a lot of that in the news, the skipping steps. And what does that mean? And, you know, even the people who trust science, are they going to want to jump on the first vaccine that comes out i mean so right i'm so well the stats on time. that are very interesting the people when people are asked if they would take uh, the, the vaccine uh close to 30 percent say that they would not even if they know that it's effective because wow. they don't trust that you know the vaccine that doesn't have side effects so uh, there's uh, a lot of problems with the whole vaccine uh, story interestingly enough also, we just found out from the autopsy on uh, George Floyd that he was, in fact, inf infected with the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, wouldn't it be interesting justice if the policemen who murdered him uh, were infected with the, this virus, which would seem to be a possibility, right? They were in pretty close contact uh, there. Well, it hasn't even been two weeks yet, so... You never know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. But, uh, we'll uh, we have a question for CD here on the, uh, or Dr. Zlotnick here on the Facebook chat. Um, there's a few things, but one, uh, uh, the first one we could look at is um, uh, about the school children again. You know, are most of them, are they asymptomatic? And, uh, you know, it's just showing up later. And then again, how do the kids quarantine away from their family? So you could talk about those hotels or. Anything. That's an excellent question. So, so uh, mo a lot of the children are asymptomatic. Many of them, most of them, uh, some, and the ones that have symptoms uh, are quite mild. You know, some runny nose or a cough, uh, low grade fever, but uh, none of those kids in the last few weeks have been really sick. You know, sick, sick. You know, if anything, very relatively mild symptoms. Um, 
Mm. Isolating children is an excellent question. Um, most of the kids, I guess, uh, from what I understand, have been sort of in the older kid age group, <laughs> I mean, like you know, so sort of uh, not teenagers, but you know, maybe you know, early preteens and kind of thing. And and you know, we have uh, rules of how to isolate. You can isolate uh, in your in your room, well ventilated, you know, being careful and using the same bathrooms if you need to, because again, a lot of people live in smaller homes here where you might have a family sharing one or two bathrooms and, you know, with hygiene and all this stuff. Um, uh, little kids, I know that I, I know a few families personally who've had uh, some of the smaller children have uh, been positive for COVID and, and they're doing fine, asymptomatic but positive. And the whole family sort of at the end decides to isolate together. That's one option uh, where the whole family could say, okay, we're all going to be going into isolation together. The whole house is like one room. You know, we're, going to, we're, not, we're isolating together for the family because it's easier with a small child, of course, to do it that way. Another option we have here in Israel is something that we we call the you know the Corona hotels or the you know in in the language here the the COVID hotels and basically the government's opened up uh, hotels across the country where if you are positive uh, you can go to the hotel and for a family can go or let's say half the family one parent can go uh, with the children who are positive and basically it's all paid by by the government and you have you have your own hotel room. In the hotel, people can move around freely because everyone is positive in the hotel, um, and so there's not they're not restricted to their own room or anything. They can move around freely in the hotel. Of course, the pools are closed and, and the gym is closed. Whatever in the hotel, actually, <laughs> the rest of the gyms in the country are open. That's a different story. But uh, but uh, but you know, but they get they, they get three meals a day and they get taken care of. And actually, the organization that I'm the director of, Terem the Clinics, we go around to the hotels and provide basic medical care. So just because your hotel doesn't mean you can't, you know, bump your leg into something or have a sore throat and have like a strep throat or an ear infection or any other, you know, myriad of problems that have come up, your regular medical problems. So actually, I go up personally uh, one day a week up to the northern part uh, near the Golan Heights in Israel, and I'll go to two, three hotels uh, and I have lists of patients, and it's all run by the army. It's all under military control. They're doing an excellent job at, uh, you know, uh, uh, at running the whole, the whole, the whole complex uh, situation. What, what do you wear when you go? So I wear full uh, protective gear. Um, uh, I wear a like a we'll call it a hazmat suit for better words, but like you know I wear a full gear with a hood, uh, an N95 mask, a uh, few pairs of layers of gloves. Um, I'm wearing a, a visor. And uh, basically, they separate it into uh, what they call yellow or green zones. The green would be the, the clean zone, and the yellow is sort of the infectious zone. And you gown up in a military tent outside. You go in. Uh, you can't touch anything, so it's very it's a, you know you're all sort of bundled up. And I have actually I can't I can't document because I can't really touch a computer. I can't bring a computer or a paper, and you know, and they have a room with like all the medical equipment. So I actually have an a earbud in one ear where I'm talking to uh, a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant uh, who's remotely in a different city, and they're opening the charts and they're documenting everything for me, or you know, uh, like sort of being a scribe while I'm uh, seeing the patients. And then I have sort of a, on the other ear a stethoscope half hooked in. So it's, you know, you try to make your make the best you can out of this, but it's very a suffocating feeling being like that for two hours, you know, uh, and seeing patients, but it, but, uh, but it works and we're taking care of these patients and we're So that's another option for people who want to, who want to quarantine. Um, yeah. So I've been doing that for about six weeks now. So really I had an interesting question this morning from someone who asked exactly how do you use a baby diaper as a mask? So that kind of took a me. clean one, hopefully. <laughs> what? A clean a one. Clean, a clean one, hopefully. A clean, a, a clean one. Uh, says, well, you know, there's this picture in this article that the CDC is recommending that for people who can't have uh, access to a surgical mask or, or, or an N95 mask, that they can use a baby diaper. And there's even a picture of someone who is putting it on and showing how with the Velcro straps you can, you know. So I'm looking at this. and It actually comes from a satirical article. Uh, which uh, I guess, I mean, if you don't really look carefully, you, you can buy into this because some of these, you know, uh, parodies look very, very real. And uh, this lady was absolutely ready to, to go out to the store with a baby diaper around her face because she didn't have any other kind of mask. Now, I, 
I don't actually know that it wouldn't work. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, it might work just as well as any other cloth uh, diaper, and it might actually be easier to put on with the <laughs> Velcro stuff. So who knows? I mean, maybe this this parody could have uh, some uh, truth to it. All the more reason it, to check your sources. You know, people will will uh, so readily buy into everything. They're so desperate to be able to have some sort of control over the situation. And I think that's that's what is so frustrating to 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 many of us is is that uh, you know it just doesn't look like we're getting any control. It's the I, light at the end of the tunnel is very dim. I have a few uh, more questions, um, but just even before we just back on the COVID hotels, I was just thinking, and forgive me if this sounds silly, but um, obviously there's a wide disparity of symptoms. So, you know, someone could be okay, but have to be home and someone else can be on ventilators. I mean, does that COVID hotel cover the spectrum? And is it possible for someone with worse COVID symptoms to almost pass those on to, to someone else who has milder symptoms? That, that's a good question, actually. Uh, so the, the COVID hotels are basically for people with, you know, mild to moderate symptoms. So any, anyone who obviously needs uh, care in a hospital, there are many patients, many, many patients admitted to hospital, but the patients who are, you know, relatively fine, they may have a bit of a fever and they may have obviously a cough and symptoms, but they're, you know, they're otherwise well, uh, they go to these hotels and they're not just left in the hotels completely unsupervised. There's a telemedicine going on as well. So all these, every patient who's admitted to the hotel, even those with basically asymptomatic or mild symptoms, uh, get sent by their, you know, we have uh, four different HMOs who cover all, uh, all, all the medical care for the patients as well. They get sent to the, they get sent to the hotel with a little kit or home if they're at home with a oxygen saturation monitor, pulse monitor, and 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 a, a thermometer basically. And they get a call. Uh, they get called the, twice a day, and they have to report their their vital signs and how they're feeling. So there's monitoring going for all these patients, even the ones that are at home, there's monitoring going on all the time by all the different uh, HMOs. So everyone's being watched quite carefully, actually. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. another, okay. important, another, another, question. another important point is also about being released from the hotel. So again, you're only released from the hotel or released from quarantine if you're at home, if you've had two negative tests. So it's not like when you feel better. So some pe we're learning a lot because we see some patients, I mean, who knows really how infectious they are, but they still have a COVID positive, you know, three weeks after. There, I've seen people in hotels there for three weeks, and even up to a month, who uh, until they have two negative tests. So we're seeing that in some patients they get, they clear it relatively fast, and in some patients uh, they remain positive for quite a while. Emily, any question there? Yeah, um, a few more people um, talking about schools, and you know, one person says, "Did the order of pediatrics get it wrong? They fully supported a return to school." Um, but even somewhere as close as Trois Rivières, right in here in Quebec, that now a number of kids have COVID. Um, and they say, you know, come September, it's likely elementary, secondary schools will open. How worried should be would should we be? And also, I mean, Doctor uh, CD, you said um, that you, you know, perhaps that Israel rolled out a little too quickly. I, I, I'm just curious, also from the medical point of view, what what you felt shouldn't have rolled out as quickly. Um, and if schools would have been, you know, included in that, let's just wait a little bit longer. Right. So, I mean, you know, again, we're, we're learning and it's so hard to know. And I think it was, it was a, in Israel, at least, I think it was an appropriate trial because we have the, the you know, the ways which we can monitor people. And like I sort of explained it, like when you open up, you expect to have you know, little fires going on. And if you're tracking people and quarantining people, it's like little fires. You can sort of put them out as they go. You can close the school. You know exactly who's been in contact. You know, in a place where you're not doing that, sort of the little fires could burn out into a forest fire. And that, that's what uh, we'd be more nervous about somewhere like, you know, North America, where they're not doing the same level of tracking and epidemiology. Um, you know, I think they they open schools to all the grades relatively quick. Uh, they started they started initially with kindergartens. And, you know, the little kids, again, the little kids pass on, it seems, from the literature, again, this is early kind of uh, stats, but it seems to be that the little the smaller children don't pass it on as well or not uh, to other children or to even to adults. Uh, so they started with that, but then they, uh, but the numbers were so low, I think there was a little bit of a euphoria and they started pushing all the other grades back in, um, which probably, you know, contributed of course to the, to the, to, to, to the bump in, in cases. 
I mean, the question is, we expect this. So, you know, I think if you wait till you're never going to see cases, you're never going to go back to school. I mean, at what point is, is how long is this going to go for? I mean, it doesn't, this doesn't seem to be like SARS, but it's going to disappear anytime soon. So there need, I think that, you know, in some, in some ways I understand, uh, you know, as long as you can monitor and quarantine and, and, and make sure this doesn't get out of control, I'm not sure what the alternative is. I mean, if you wait till September, then the same thing's going to happen in September. So at some point, I, I'm not sure, again, we're all, I keep saying, we, know, we don't really know because this is a novel coronavirus. And novel they go off and with everything with this virus, we have to say, I don't know. Novels that one, you thing, wrote. one thing I do know is that Miguel has made the decision that uh, we are not going to have live classes in, in September. Uh, my guess is that we probably will not be having them in January either. I think we'll probably go the whole year, uh, quote, online. Uh, when you go down to the Miguel campus, it's eerie these days. I, I can tell you there's just nobody there. Downtown is, is pretty eerie uh, altogether. I mean, you, you just don't see people. I, I now have uh, permission to go into the office twice a week for three hours each, each time. I can go on Tuesday morning and Thursday afternoon for three hours. But you're all by yourself. <laughs> so Miguel is very careful about uh, monitoring. And, you know, I, I had to describe exactly how I would go. I mean, the office happens to be just inside the main door, so I have no problem. I don't meet anybody. But you have to go in with your card, which is timed, so that you can only go in at the allotted time. You have to time out. And, uh, of course, you have available all the disinfectant stuff and everything. And uh, the research labs have opened up partially except that only two students are per lab and it's only six hours at a time and they have to maintain distance. You know, this is a very, very difficult thing to do in research. Research doesn't work like that in six hour blocks. You cannot do, do very much. But I, you know, I, I guess it is better than nothing because at least the students are still somewhat uh, active. And the, the main concern now, and uh, not only with us, but in general universities, is what is going to happen to the student population. Um, in the US, they, they're predicting some awful numbers, 30-40% uh, 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 reduced uh, attendance. And of course, that's also because they, the exorbitant uh, fees uh, at American universities. So uh, you know, students are not so keen to spend uh, $70,000 a year to view online courses. Uh, our fees are much, much less, and uh, we have a different sort of academic uh, culture here. And um, so far, it seems that our acceptance rate is, is pretty high, and uh, students are willing to. Uh, lectures are not a problem. They can be done very well online. That works well. Labs are a problem. What, what do you do? And so far, and the, the only thing one can do is push them back. And hopefully either by the winter semester certainly by next year things open up but I mean, it really is, is, is just a monstrous situation so let me ask you guys Jonathan how do you think this is going to play out in the long run you're asking me to look into my crystal ball which I don't have and don't believe in uh, I, I I don't know I mean there are just too many variables to really speculate I mean there there are two two main ways that you can think of, which is an, 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 an efficacious vaccine that works very well, or a treatment that manages to keep people off of uh, ventilators and, and out of the ICU, right? So you, you either can treat this very, very well, or you can provide uh, immunity through vaccines very well. And it's hard to know what's going to pay up first. And um, it, it looks like we're going we're gonna to be stuck in this sort of weird new reality for, for quite a while. Well, Sita, let me ask you, because this we're going to delve into your area now. We're going to okay. talk about cannabis. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, uh, cannabis, of course, is, is an accepted medical treatment for many conditions. And you're, you're an expert in that, right? Because you, you've been... Uh, looking into that and, and advising people about this, mainly for things like depression and anxiety and, and uh, right? PTSD, for, yeah. yeah, for which there's a lot of evidence. Uh, there was a very interesting study uh, that um, 
came out of uh, Canada, actually, uh, from uh, University of Lethbridge, where the researchers looked at different strains of, uh, of cannabis, mm -hmm. obviously different ratios of tetrahydrocannabinol to cannabidiol, and uh, found that uh, some of these strains, when you extract them in cell culture, they can block the receptors for, uh, for the virus. Yeah. It's very interesting. And of course, this spawned all kinds of discussion and, and arguments and, and publications in, in, in the media uh, yeah. about cannabis being, you know, being one savior. of the okay, right. And as we know, in vitro and in vivo aren't always exactly the same. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, they, one of the one of the the, the classic statements in, in epidemiology is is that uh, mice lie and and monkeys exaggerate, right. right? But but that isn't even talking about culture studies. <laughs> that's that's even more problematic. Well, there's another saying, right, which is that we've cured cancer in petri dishes, you know, over and over and over again. So yeah, right, right. On the other hand, things do start there, right? You got to yeah. start. Somewhere. You got to. Yeah somewhere. So uh, have you seen anything further about this, about, you know, some... No, I saw, the, I saw the same study you mentioned, actually, and, you know, a lot of the other uh, news that was spawning. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that with uh, cannabis, as we know, sometimes people go a bit overboard for it being the savior for everything. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement about it, and that's great. Uh, but, you know, I think just you have to, you know, everything should be tempered with, you yeah. know... I mean, the, the researchers so, there already were, you know, offering the opinion that maybe this can be used in mouthwashes and gargles and, you know, to prevent the virus from preventing. CBD, CBD helps for anything culture, but... Uh, <laughs> right. right. Seems, and, you know, of course, far-fetched, but there are other things that at one time seemed far-fetched and eventually turned out to have some, some merit. So uh, all we can really say is that a study like this, which is, you know, a study in a, in a, in a Petri dish, uh, can be a springboard for further study. And it's it's worthwhile to examine it further, but but uh, I, I think uh, uh, getting stoned is not the answer to COVID, although it may. Yeah. <laughs> it can ease some anxiety, that's for sure. Um, yeah. We have some interesting questions that I'm going to kind of tie in together. Um, you know, we've been this has been now three months, let's say three and a half months or something. Um, and a lot of stuff, you know, has changed over time in terms of what we know, uh, you know, now, whether it's walking by someone in the street, we don't need to be so, so scared just in the passerby kind of thing. Uh, when we're running, you know, again, you could, the amount of exposure, you know, makes it makes a difference and where that exposure happens. Um, so someone said that they read on the WHO website that it actually recommends one meter distance now and like why that would have changed. Um, and the other one, oh, about surfaces. Um, you know, it seems now that there's some evolving literature and, uh, um, about surfaces that maybe we don't need to be, we know a little bit more now. If we could just comment on that. Anyone? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the surfaces just from, from like, you know, I think even the last time I was on the show, which I think was about a month ago, maybe, I don't know, you know but that we sort of said, you know, I'd be hard pressed to believe that that was a major uh, you know, way you can you, know, you can get infected. And I think Joey said the same thing that, you know, that's kind of you would need a, a, again, think about that, that you would need like a large viral load to like survive on a surface, touch it and then like put it into a, you know, sort of your nasal or oral cavity in order to get infected. And that's sort of, you know, many steps and the virus isn't some, you know, you know, it's very it, it, it's fragile. You know, it, it won't do that. So that that that'll be sort of. I can understand and I don't think that's that's a major way, you know, certainly be careful with your hands as much as possible. But, you know, certainly throughout this whole thing, I was never, you know, wiping down my bananas with uh, <laughs> that I would bring home from the from the market, you know, with uh, with alcohol before, you know, touching them. You know, there's, you know, I think that's reasonable to say. Yeah, that's, very, that's very interesting because one of the questions I get asked so often is not whether or not I should wipe down my groceries, with what? but with what? <laughs> <laughs> right. Whether whether three percent hydrogen peroxide or should it be seventy percent uh, isopropyl alcohol or can I just use soap or dishwashing detergent or, or whatever? Uh, my view on that is 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 that as long as you wash your hands after handling these things, that's about as much as you need to do. Uh, I don't think that that uh, uh, wiping groceries down is going to give you a significant uh, added protection. 
And uh, I'm walking on the street. I tell you, when I, I, I go for my daily walk and I walk on the sidewalk, and I've made the decision that I will stay on that sidewalk. I am not going to give way to anyone uh, because I like to monitor how many people see me coming and then go off the sidewalk and, you know, try to go around me so as not to pass within what is two feet, you know, when you're passing someone on the sidewalk. And uh, it's interesting. It's, it's, you know, you feel like a leper walking there because people will get out of your way, you know. Uh, and I, I, I don't think that that's reasonable. You're not going to get this by walking uh, by someone. Has, has, it's, it's interesting how it's become almost like a, mo a morality issue. You know, like you're immoral for like walking on the street or walking past someone. When again, the, the chance of catching or, or getting infected by COVID by walking by someone, that's not, that's not really how all the transmission happens. Again, we're talking oh, about people. And of course, we have a lot of accumulating evidence now from all the tracing studies of, of how the infection does happen. Mm -hmm. And if it did happen like that, from passing on the street, we'd, we'd see this. We'd yep. see this, the, the, the tracing. So what does tracing show us? It leads us to the meatpacking plants, to, to the, the warehouses, uh, to, to religious uh, uh, institutions, uh, you know, to, to telephone call answering centers, where you have a lot of people sitting in, in an environment where the air doesn't circulate all that well. That's, that's where this is, uh, is happening. But and at home, it happens when someone who's infected comes into the home. Yeah. But again, you're not talking about, uh, like, if you're going for a walk and there's not a lot of people in the street and you pass by, okay, fine. But once you start going onto St. Catherine Street and it ends up being summer in mid-July, like if in a pre-COVID world when everyone was out at that point, you're in a crowded place. So I think it, it is important, Joe, I know that you want to keep, like, stay on the sidewalk to make your, to make the point, it's okay, whatever. But if all of a sudden... You know, there's a lot of people out and all those things. At that point, that that's when I think the two meter distance, that's when you need that two meter distance, right? When it goes from the outside, it can become crowded. You need yeah. the two meter distance if you're going to be staying for any significant time within that distance, not when you're just passing someone by. No, if you have a lot of people like we've been seeing in the demonstrations, that's a different story because they're, they're standing, you know, face to face, breathing in each other's face. That's a completely different uh, I, story. I guess actually that brings us to the next question that you just got me thinking about um, uh, running races, you know, because because everyone's running at their own pace, kind of. So, you, so I guess if they limited the amount of participants and staggered the starts, you could almost probably do a running race. That's a little, you know, you, you've been and Not to, that I was going to do it. <laughs> but. No, no. Uh, Emily, be our guinea pig. Yeah. Do it and we'll see what happens. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I know you've done a few marathons as well. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. yeah. You, know, you know how those things start. Yeah, no, I know. You're all over each other. But, you know, oh, if you, yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to think. But that brings us to another question that someone had about outdoor workouts. Uh, I've been invited to a bunch also with uh, different trainers working in various outside, you know, outdoor situations. Um, I'm not comfortable doing that yet. I could just go do something by myself. So what are you, I mean, gyms are not going to be, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know how gyms are going to reopen and function, um, or not all of them anyway. What, what are your thoughts on that? I, if you're outdoors and you're not crowded and you're two meters at least away and you know, you're spread out like that, you know, the, I think the risks are super low, super, super low. You're talking about, you know, you're outside, well ventilated in, in someone's whatever garden or backyard, for example. And you know, Again, you're not crowded in, you're not using the same, even though we talk about the materials, you're not using the same equipment. Everyone brings their own, you know, uh, for example, yoga class. Everyone brings their own yoga mat from home, for example. And, you know, you're, you're two meters away from everyone and you're outside. I, I would put the risk of transmission there, I mean, Joe Curry, like, close to zero. I mean, really, really yeah. super. Uh, yeah. You will be inhaling some virus when you're outside because you're inhaling billions, trillions, trillions of molecules of all kinds. Uh, in fact, I just I just did a video on that yesterday, which I, I think is pretty interesting, where I talked about just what you're inhaling when you inhale a breath. You're inhaling molecules that were exhaled by Julius Caesar or Napoleon or anyone else that you care to talk about in history because of the mixing in the atmosphere. And this, of course, goes not only for the nitrogen, oxygen, argon, or whatever else there is, but also for, for viruses of all kinds. With every breath, we take in some virus. The question is, what is the infective dose? Are we getting, you know, enough? It's not one virus. It's not two. It's not ten. It might be a thousand. 
that you know we 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 don't know but uh even then you're not going to inhale that many by passing uh, someone. It, there, there's this time element that, that has to be taken into account. And as you know, we've talked so often, it's the same thing when you talk about toxicity of something. A, a substance will have an inherent toxicity, but whether or not you're affected depends on how long you're in contact with it, what your exposure is. So there's no question here that this virus is terribly infected but it still depends on how many you are in contact with. So one has to, to be reasonable, and at some time, you have to take some chances. You can't live your life like a hermit, right? We're, we're gonna have to take some, some chances uh, sometime, and we're, there's going to be some sacrifices that are, are made. Uh, it's, it's you know not very pleasant to think about, but the the only way that eventually this will wane is when there are fewer people from whom to be affected. When a lot of people, unfortunately, have departed this world because of the virus, and the ones who are remaining are less likely to infect. Or if we, or if we get to the, to the point, where, I'm not sure about uh, you know people are like passing away, but people who have become infected and now are immune, and that's another way the virus turns out. Where oh, people hopefully have- that- they become immune. We don't know that for sure. That, right? That's the preferred method of be, <laughs> catching yeah. the virus and yes. being immune. We, and we, we don't know how long they stay immune for. We don't you know, know a lot. It's, it's a a probably lot. Not a measles is probably the outlier in this, in that the immunity lasts so long. Right. With other viruses, the immunity does not last that long. We just we have a question here that again, no one's going to be able to answer. But I feel just because I feel for this person because I think that they asked last uh, week also. Um, the answer is tomorrow. <laughs> oh, that would be very nice. But the question is basically about their grandchildren. Uh, I know you won't be able to ask when they can stay over and sleep over in their house necessarily. But I did see something in the, in the New York Times today that was very cute. Um, and it was about letting your grandchildren hug you around your, like small grandchildren, you know, they're standing up, let them hug you around your knees like they normally would give you a hug, right? You know, you don't need to, you're not passing breath and you're not putting your faces close to each other for a two-year-old, you know? So you're probably okay to have them hug you like that. Um, but I just, you got, you, you can comment on that. I saw, I saw as well, you know, like this uh, cute thing where the kids were, were, you know, hugging the grandparents through like this sort of like plastic saran wrap sheet almost, I don't know, like, and, and, you know, it's quite emotional and it's quite sad and uh, I think we still have to be careful there. I mean, you know, again, more literature shows kids might not, might, might not be great at transmitting it, but they still can and especially with the grandparents who are, you know, the, in a higher risk, unfortunately, due to age and, um, you know, it's hard because, you know, <laughs> I also, I feel for everybody, but uh, I still tell people no. I mean, I still think that, that to being, you know, here it's, it's really uh, important to be cautious because, you know, we're still only at three months and, you know, hopefully we'll have many more years to hug our grandkids and it's a bit of a sacrifice. But uh, if you're in a high risk group, not only age, but any other high risk group you could be. Now, for other uh, medical reasons, um, I think it's certainly still prudent to be cautious. Okay, well, we've covered some ground there. I don't know how much of it was new, uh, but uh, it seems that every day some study comes out that you need to comment on. You know, uh, things change. Things change with this, and uh, it's also interesting how the abnormal is slowly becoming normal. You know, yes. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite ready now. I'm, I'm, I am going to go shopping. I'm quite ready to... <laughs> Let's cover the nose also. <laughs> go like that. I mean, it doesn't, uh, doesn't feel so great, but uh, I guess it does reduce the chance uh, uh, somewhat. But I think it's still important to remember that there is a lot of quackery out there. And there are all kinds of, of things that are being recommended from you know, intravenous uh, uh, vitamin C to eucalyptus oil up the rectum, uh, which, of course, have no clinical uh, evidence. Okay, so that's it. We've uh, run out of time. We will do this again. 
Actually, and, maybe uh, maybe we could say next week we're actually focusing on the end more part of the COVID and more conversations. And we're going to be kind of pivoting to the restaurant industry. Uh, and we're going to have Fred Morin, who's the co-owner of Joe Beef, Liverpool House, Le Van Pepillon, uh, McKiernan here in Montreal, some of Montreal's best restaurants, and Joel Teitelman, former Montrealer who's in New York now and has the Mile End Deli um, and has been doing a lot of work uh, with frontline workers in his restaurant as well. And so that, that'll be a fun discussion also. Uh, that'll be at 5 p.m. next Thursday, and we will advertise that as well. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks yeah. to all of our viewers out there. And remember that uh, we are recording this and you can view it at some later time. Emily, you want to tell them where they can view it? Sure. It'll be on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel um, as well, where all of them are. And in our newsletter as well, and right? And in our newsletter. Yep, yep. You could access it. Yes, and there. if you go to our website, which is mcgill.ca slash OSS, you can sign up for our newsletter. Thanks, right. everyone. And that every Saturday morning at 6 a.m. Uh, on the dot in your inbox with a bevy of entertainment and uh, sound scientific information. So until we meet again next time, hope all the chemistry in your life comes out just right. Thank you.